Hey guys, Pat here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And now I'm on a new phase here on the pool table refurbishing and setting up. And I have some more videos for different sections of this uh, progression here. So basically what I've done is I've purchased a real nice, well I think it's a real nice pool table. Um, they claim it's about a $3,500 table. That was 25 years or 20 years ago. So far, I've, we've brought the table in, we've set it up, we've leveled the slates, we've sealed the seams in between the three slate uh, table here, we got it level, and now I am in the process of replacing the, the bumpers on the rails. Um, I figure I've got it down this far, it's a 20 year old table, it's probably time to change out the rubber goods or the bumpers for the rails. So that's what we're doing today. Um, I've done three so far to kind of get practiced up on it. If you go and you purchase a table and you decide, well, it's a good idea to go ahead and replace the rubber goods on there because it's a 20 year old table. These cushions still felt very soft, but these are just a little bit softer. These are both K66 rubber. You see the red one is the new one and the lighter colored one or the tan one is the old one that I pulled off of another rail. So you can see how flexible the red one is and how stiff the uh, tan one is. Now there are a specific way to put these on your rail and I'll show you the old one. The new one looks a little bit different as far as the very top. There's a little cloth strip on the top side of this rail of this rail bumper and they're shaped just a little bit different see this got a cloth embedded in the rubber and if you turn these up you're going to see that they're shaped just a little bit different now on the red one this side is the bottom of the bumper this is the top side of the rail where you would you would actually see with the cloth on and you see this was shaped the same way this is flat actually it seems like it's a little bit concave just a slightly bit and this is convex just a little bit this is the top and this is the bottom and what I'll do is I'll show you some different things that you're going to need to complete this project so what we have here is we have a hammer and I, I, I went out and broke down and bought an electric stapler and you're going to be typically using quarter inch or 5 16 inch uh, staples. This is a T50 uh, Aero electric stapler. You're going to need some contact cement. I know that there's probably other adhesives that you can use out there to attach the bumpers to the rails. And I just like to have a couple of little receptacles here to keep the bolts. These bolts here are used for um, bolting the pockets to the rails and all that comes together. Um, I have 5 16 T50 staples and then I also have some half inch staples just in case I need to nail the feather strip. The old fabric seems a little bit thicker because it is a felt and this fabric seems just a little tiny bit thinner so when you go to install the new fabric into the old rails there might just be just a tiny bit of slop I came across one so far that's actually needed the half inch staples for to secure the feather strip to the rail so again I'll show you if you didn't see it in the in the any of the other videos there are definitely a top side and a bottom side to this fabric this side here is just a little bit more fuzzy or hairy if you want to call it and this side here looks just a little bit different yet you can actually see it's a little bit smoother and so that's the top side that's supposed to give you a faster ball play this is the old felt that was on there and you can see the texture is different and it actually stretches this a little bit easier than that worst cloth and you know you guys out there that have had experience doing some of this stuff maybe you can share with us your tips and tricks as to how uh, you 
may have done it different so anybody out there watching can benefit uh, from your comments. You're going to need a pen to mark with because you're going to have to taper your your bumpers when you install them on the rails. You're going to need something to pull your old staples or if you make a mistake on your new cloth you're going to need that to pull your new staples. A serrated blade for cutting your rubber you're going to need a scraper or a good sharp chisel in order to clean the glue off of your old rails. And I sharpen this every single time I do a new rail. So each rail I, sh I sharpen this like three or four times in the rails that I've actually done so far. I've done three rails so far. And of course you're going to need a utility knife and a scraper which has got a razor blade type. Uh, knife in there and plenty of blades. You're going to need cushion facings and that goes on each side of the pocket for on each edge that you do. You're going to need a mallet. Some guys will use a mallet and they'll just put dress it up like I got it here. Some guys will take a block of wood and put uh, fabric on the wood and use that to hammer in their feather strip. I've also found in playing around with this is that sandpaper will actually help fine-tune uh, you know shaping these when you go to cut these out and I'll show you how to do with it do all that and of course a hammer just in case you need a hammer sometimes your staples won't seat all the way in here so it's a good idea just to come along and, and tap them in with your hammer uh, if you had a tack hammer that would work too okay the last little goodie here that's been a real that I found real helpful that I've never seen anybody else use is just uh, one of these clamping workhorses here. One of the nicer tools that Black & Decker came out with years ago and I've since rebuilt the top of this and it looks like heck again but it's still in real good shape. I use a soft cloth to put in here and then I can put my rail and everything in here while I'm working on it and I can clamp it and it'll hold it and uh, keep it stationary. So I'll go ahead and get started with that being said and show you what I got show you what I got going on here just rest that in between the two jaws then I just start pulling pulling staples just remove the old felt Now, one thing I wanted to point out is I, enable, I label everything that I'm doing here just in case I come across a reason why it should go back into the same place that it came off of. So this rail is going to go on the table in the exact same position as it came off. And so I even label the old, old felt here just in case I want to go back and use the felt as a reference um, in case I get confused. Again, this is the first time I've done this, so uh, I want to make sure that everything that I do, I can go back and reference and see where I made a mistake or where I can make an improvement. Now the other thing that I forgot to show you is uh, keeping a pair of pliers in ha on hand. That way you can pull the st staples the rest of the way with a pair of pliers. Okay, here's that feather strip that I was talking about. That's that thin little piece of wood right here that is actually um, cut into a dado joint on the top of the rail. The way to pull that out is just to give the old felt just a little bit of a pull and then just lightly pull up on that feather strip as you're coming along there. 
And you got to be careful that you don't bend the feather strip too much or you'll end up breaking the feather strip. Okay, so that's going to fit in there kind of loosely. I might have to go ahead and staple that so you'll get a you'll get a picture of me doing that. But I keep uh, I keep the old felt and I have an old felt numbered. I know I have that as a reference just in case I need it. Now I just go ahead and mark somewhere in the center. That way it's a quick reference when I drop this back in there and I got the felt underneath there. I got this reference point uh, right here so I know where to line up the feather strip on the rail. And it does matter how the feather strip goes on there. As you can see this side here is square and the other side has a taper to it. It's cut at an angle to match the to match the um, the corner pocket. So we'll just take this. I know that this is the top because that's the part I have the line on. And I go ahead and put a number on here in reference to the number that I've corresponded with this particular rail. This is the fourth fourth rail that I've worked on. So this is 104. I've got it labeled. So now taking this apart. This hasn't been too awful difficult. I've just taken my sharp chisel. And this is just a standard wood chisel. And don't worry guys, I'm not sticking my hand underneath the chisel. Those just peel off pretty easy. And this right here you can just generally, a lot of times, just peel back with your finger. At least that's been my experience anyway. And that will just come right off there. Again, I keep all these extras, all the parts that came off of this particular rail until I'm done, just in case, you know, so when I go to cut the new ones out, that I know how far back to cut and what they've done in the past, the professionals have done in the past to actually set this table up. I don't want to, I don't want to make any assumptions. Now, the other thing I wanted to add in this uh, conversation is I've seen most of the other guys do this and that is to put down a blanket you know to protect protect your new cloth so I have this new cloth down here I don't want to start putting a bunch of tools on here and, and risk either staining it or cutting it uh, or putting some sort of a mar on it so putting putting uh, some sort of a blanket down to protect your work surface <laughs> which is our table right now is I think it's a great idea. Now we're going to go over and uh, clean up that rail, clean the glue off of it. I just clamp that into the vise, to the workhorse here. And then I just use use this chisel as a scraper and just remove any of the old glue that's on here. You don't have to get that glue off 100%, but you do need a good smooth surface to work off of. So any of that standing glue, I think, should be removed. Now there's a couple of different ways that I'm using this chisel. And you'll see that I usually have a scrape motion coming back this way. And more so than going this way, because if I go this way along with the grain, um, very likely to gouge in and cause splinters to come up. But on an edge surface like this, a guy can actually get in there and use the chisel like this and not worry about gouging because you're going, the grains are actually coming out this way in the wood and it's not going to grab the blade and cause the blade to dip in. And that cleans that off pretty good. It's probably more than what it needs. I can use that chisel in here just a little bit if I'm really careful, but I want always me to be cognizant. I always want to be cognizant that this chisel could dig in to the uh, wood. This is what the sanding block is for. Is I'll just go and just barely hit the corners 
or there might just be just a little bit of fuzz sticking out. I'm just dragging it back and forth across there, not getting real serious about sanding it. But that'll knock, that'll knock all the glue off of the corners, but, you know, any, any little pieces of glue that might be sticking up on that corner. I'm not rounding off the edges or anything like that. I'm keeping my sandpaper flat with the surface that they've uh, put on here. Keeping the same angle and flatness in there. Okay, that gives me a good clean surface to work off of. Um, there's a little bit of glue residue in there. That's fine as long as it's solid and as long as it's uh, not lifting up. Uh, from what, I, from what I understand, that's just fine and ready to go. Now this is ready for the rubber bumper to be adhered onto the surface. Okay guys, now we're out here in the fresh air. And the reason for that is, is we've got some uh, contact cement that we're going to be using. And it's always good to be outside when you're using this stuff because it's... Uh, make you pretty lightheaded and it probably says on there somewhere in the state of California it causes cancer um, I've been to California so I don't know if that counts but uh, yeah you can, if you're in California and you're using this stuff you can get cancer probably anyway of course I say that tongue-in-cheek it's a good idea to be be out in a well ventilated area when you're using this stuff I like using these chip brushes here. They're just cheap, disposable brushes. You can, I think I got like a package of six of them in different shapes and sizes for like $5. I think you can get them on sale a lot of times for cheaper than that. But anyways, I'm just gonna throw this thing away once I get done with these uh, three different rails that I'm doing. Of course, I got these all cleaned up, ready to apply the, the bumpers. Again, these go on one way this is the top this is the bottom and this one here is wider than this side but this has a curvature on the top of it now we just apply it be quick about it because it sets up fairly fast especially in the sun and I found when I kind of brush towards the edge like that it kind of keeps it a little bit cleaner in the application process it's already starting to set up it's better to do it in the shade without a little bit of breeze because when you set this stuff up it's supposed to be just tacky okay thoroughly get that surface I think I'll do one at a time the other night I could do all three and uh, still beat the point where it's too dry where you got to add some more glue to it again I'm kind of raking towards the outside and that keeps me a cleaner edge I don't really care if I get glue on the inside in that little crevice right there okay wait for a few minutes let that get tacky making sure I got this right side up Press it down firmly to get it to adhere. Take your finger and rub that and take any of the excess glue off of there. And continue doing that with the next ones. Again, if there's a little excess glue, you can, while it's in this, uh, still elastic state here rub your finger on that and it'll it'll come right off now you want to be particularly careful on this that you don't have any uh, extra glue because that'll telescope through on your your fabric because your fabrics going to go around this and onto the underside so getting that getting the surface nice and smooth and getting all of the uh, excess glue off of that is important 
Okay, I'm gonna let these set up, and then we're gonna trim, trim these uh, to the correct angle, and then we'll apply the uh, this rubber on the ends. Okay, guys, it's about 45 minutes later, um, after gluing the rubber bumpers onto the rails, I'm gonna mark the rubber on the rails to match the um, angle and slope of the pockets. So you just take the straight edge and follow the slope along. And then on the back side, you just line up this corner here with the corner where you left off. And that will give you the proper slope and angle of the cut here that you're going to make on the rubber. Now we don't want to tell Mrs. Rain that I'm using her good bread knife to do this work. How she heard me. <laughs> so I'm going to go at the same angle here. And you need a serrated edge to make this happen. And so you just saw at the right angle and follow the lines just on the just on this side of the line and then kind of bend down on this this here to keep the kerf opened up on that rubber and keep your knife from binding Again, it really helps to have one of these little vices here, these little workbenches to uh, hold your work still while you're doing this, this kind of thing. Now I got this block of sandpaper with some fresh 120 grit, 120 grit sandpaper and I'm going to try to just lightly fine tune this. You can actually sand rubber. I don't want to sand this too much, I just want to focus more on the rubber to get that try to get that angle as perfect as I can and I notice I'm drawing down and not drawing up because I want to make sure that I don't I mean the glue is on there nice and tight but I don't want to work this back and forth and try to start tearing the corners off of this so I'm drawing down lifting up the sandpaper coming down pressing uh, making pressure coming down instead of going up. Now the way you can double check that is you put a straight edge on there but you can also use your line of sight. If you look right straight down that you can see where the angle is. It might be just a little bit high right here. I can work on that just a little bit more. But your line of sight you should be able just to barely see the uh, face of that cut right there. I'm pretty close this front edge looks really good. I got you to sand the bottom side here just a little bit more and then I'll be ready to do the other side. And of course the harder you push down the rounder that's going to be so when I get down to pretty game, bring pretty close to where I want to be I, I just do it lightly. You know this takes a lot of time to do and I could have very well just left it at that and put those those rubber ends on there the way it is but uh, I'm trying to get it as right on as I can possibly get it the whole time I'm sanding this I'm looking down the plane of this thing to see if where the high spot is just barely have a high spot right here where my finger is and I can just work that a little bit and that's ready to go now I'll go to the other side by going to the other cut corner where the angle starts I want to draw a line between the very top of this other line and down to where that cut starts. Okay, I'm ready to cut. I'll try my Leatherman. It's got a pretty nice serrated blade on it. And what I'll do is I'll start again and see how well that cuts, cuts this as opposed to uh, Mama's bread knife. Being careful 
to not uh, stab myself here. I'm keeping my eye on this line and also on the line on the back side. It actually works better than the bread knife. So any deviation in this uh, is going to be taken out by that black cover or black rubber piece that goes over this whole whole face here. So uh, you just have to get it close, as close as you can, and then the black piece that goes over here is going to be nice and flat. And so uh, I'm just trying to maintain a good a good true angle here as to the, the way the manufacturer had it. So I'm going to go through and cut the rest of these and we'll get back with you the next point. The next thing we're going to do is put those black pieces on there. Okay we're back outside once again. Now we're going to put the uh, pocket facings on. This is the rubber little things that go right on here. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get those glued up. So I just removed all the dust off of the face of this. Here's the side pocket here. Okay, it's ready to be tacked on there. So you did, obviously this is square and this is a different shape, but what we want to do is be able to cover the whole thing, especially of this because this is where the ball makes contact, so we want to make sure that we got that covered up there. And that gives you a nice flat surface to work from. And this is a shorter one because it's a corner pocket. And we'll let, let the other side dry just for a few more minutes, uh, get, let it get tacky, and then we'll be ready to trim these up. Okay, now we're ready to go ahead and trim this out to follow the contour of the bumper and the rail itself. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow along with my blade, just following the rail and bumper down along here with the blade. So I'm keeping my blade flat against the, the bumper. So I keep the same keep the same angle and I just work along the side of that down using my serrated blade making sure I don't cut the finish on the top of the rail now if you know, notice on a lot of serrated blades that you'll have one side that you sharpen from and then the other side is left alone. Well, I have a tendency to want to take and the, the part that is smooth on the back side, use that against the, against the surface of this because the blade would have a tendency to want to kind of bite in. I don't know if that makes any sense at all, but if you have the flat side facing flat down, it'll have a tendency to cut straighter. So I'm going to trade positions and I'm going to keep that flat side on this straight surface right here. Now I have a tendency to err on the side of caution and I'd rather be a little bit of material left, left high than taking too much off because you want this to be a nice sharp defined corner when you get done putting the cloth on and again on the bottom side here okay I haven't seen anybody do this but if this this isn't going to be perfect so I take that sandpaper I had earlier and I just take and sand that down to where everything is parallel and flat here. Now I realize the guys that do this for a living, you know, they're wanting to do it fast and be a, be a fast and efficient, but for somebody who is just a homeowner and, you know, he's done it for the first time, um, I like to take my time and make sure that I do it right. 
or as right as I can get it. Now I'll just take the fuzz off of that. Okay, that finishes out a side pocket. I might have to do a little trim work right down in here, but I'll do that a little bit later. This is gonna be a corner pocket. You have eight of those. Okay, now this one here needs to be cleaned off face and this the, so this slopes back and matches the, uh, the inside of the pocket here. Okay, now that you got an idea of how to do that, I'm going to go ahead and knock out the last two. That'll uh, finish out this segment of the pool table restoration recovering. <laughs> uh, thanks for stopping by. Take care and God bless.